Welcome to Kids Considered, where two pediatricians discuss children's health topics of interest to parents in a podcast with new subjects considered every episode. I'm Dr. Lena Vanderlist. And I'm Dr. Dean Blumberg. And we're both pediatricians at UC Davis Children's Hospital in Sacramento, California. So when I initially started researching and preparing for this episode, I was home with Mira for her third fever since winter started. And I think, honestly, things have finally started calming down a little bit from last winter, which was her first winter in daycare. But I was thinking about all of this, and I really remember my husband looking at me one night. We're like laying in bed during this illness, and he was like, this can't be normal, right? (laughs) Like, is there something wrong with her? This cannot be normal. Mm -hmm, Because she just was getting sick so frequently. Yeah. I mean, and even for me as a pediatrician who tells parents this is normal all day, I was like, is this normal? Um, It did feel extreme to be the one living through it. And so hopefully these questions never make it to you as an infectious disease doctor. And they're getting blocked by me in primary care. But I'm curious if you have like a usual spiel you tell parents about starting daycare. You know, we used to see these actually all the time because because we didn't have an immunologist. Um, Now we have an immunologist. So we send those referrals their way. But, you know, we say the same thing as you do, that you can get one illness with a fever per month. And that can be normal in the first year or two, especially for children who are in daycare. Mm hmm. Yes. So to tame my frustration from spending all of our money on sending our kid to a daycare that she misses half of during the winter, (laughs) in combination with a recent study that I saw that was making headlines about preschool attendance and academic successes, I thought we could do an episode talking about daycare and early childhood education. Well, this is perfect um, because this is really a, a common issue that parents face. So We will talk about studies looking at the advantages and drawbacks of early daycare enrollment and, of course, the illnesses, all the illnesses. (laughs) And some things that you may consider when you're looking for high-quality care for your child. So when families are considering child care for their child before they turn school age, which is typically five to six years of age here in the U.S., there are a few options. You can take care of your kid in your home with a nanny or a relative or in someone else's home. This is known as in-home daycare, or you can go to a center-based daycare. And how a family chooses their care is totally influenced by the family values, affordability, accessibility, and availability. But more than half of children in the U.S. under five years old regularly attend some form of -of out-of-home child care. So we're acutely aware that high quality and affordable child care is not accessible to all families with the natural average price of child care per child around 10000 plus annually. We have linked some resources for subsidized child care on our website. One amazing program is Head Start, and this is a federally supported child care program that delivers child development services in center-based, home-based, or family child care settings. Yeah, Head Start, and they also have Early Head Start for the little ones under three is amazing. Um, And you you do have to have like a certain income to qualify. Um, But really, like quality daycare doesn't even feel accessible to many working families who have the financial means to enroll. Like Tom and I joked that we should have put our names on a wait list before we even tried to conceive (laughs) because it took us 11 months after she was born to even get off a wait list of one place. Yeah, so there's staffing shortages. Um, This results in long wait lists and daycare centers. And so this makes it out of reach for many families. So when looking at how early daycare is going to impact your child's academic and social emotional development, I want to make it clear because this is one thing that parents come in and talk to me about all the time. Like, am I ruining them if I put them in daycare at, at six months or something like that? I want to tell you that the data is lacking. So this is a really hard thing to study for a lot of different reasons. And to be honest, the results are kind of all over the place. But there are a few studies that do look into this, and we'll get into them. So one of the most discussed studies about this was performed by the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. And it followed about 1,000 kids in various types of child care over time. 
That study found that the use of childcare was associated with a slightly higher cognitive outcome if you enrolled your child after 18 months and a slightly lower one if you en- enrolled your child before 18 months. Overall, if your kid was enrolled throughout that period, which is the most common, right? It's not like you're going to put your kid in at six months and then be like, oh, at 18 months, I'm going to pull them out and we're going to try something new. It aired towards being beneficial. So I wouldn't worry about you like ruining your kids from an academic standpoint at all. They did find a very small negative outcome on behavior. Um, So like some of the biting or or hitting, especially if they had a lower age of enrollment. I mean, I can't say this surprises me so much. Like definitely Mira went through a little biting phase. Mm-hmm. I always would come home and like find her like squirreling her food and toys like under her bottom because she like didn't want to share with anyone. <laughs> um but but in the end I also think anecdotally that that she has learned to really share and and interact well with other kids and stuff later. So this was just a, a very small finding there. Another finding that comes up frequently in research about early childhood education is that the benefits of quality early childhood education are seen more significantly in kids from lower income communities. So there was a recent study out of the University of Minnesota's Institute of Child Development, and it found that students from low income communities who attended full day preschool programs in or next to local elementary schools showed higher academic and social gains by third grade than their peers who attended half-day programs. Yeah, this was the one that came out recently that kind of was making all the headlines about like, does daycare make your kids smarter? You know, they always tend to make headlines because parents are so worried about this. And I think again and again, really, it does suggest that quality of care does matter. And it's not to say that quality of care means that they need like organic lunches and practicing like Montessori principles and only using wooden toys or teaching your kid multiple languages. What that means is that care is consistent, developmentally appropriate, and emotionally supportive, and the environment is healthy and safe. There's going to be a positive effect on children and their families. Mm -hmm. And organic lunches are better though, right? (laughs) (laughs) Tune into our episode on organics for that. More on that. So before we dive into the data on illness and child care and daycare, um, what type of things can help inform parents of a high quality daycare situation? Definitely. So you want to find a program that emphasizes active play. We've discussed this before multiple times that kids learn from directly interacting with objects in the physical world. So touching, smelling, tasting, uh oh, germs. That's probably where they get that. Um, you want them to come home dirty. I would always crack up because every time Mira would come home in like a different outfit than I sent her in. Uh, <laughs> but that is a good thing, right? She's getting messy. She's she's painting. Ideally, you want to find a daycare that limits screen time. Hopefully it's limited or non-existent. And then smaller ratios of children to caregivers are the best. Um, and so this will usually increase as the age of the child does. But generally, the more teachers, the better to supervise and interact with the children. Absolutely. For staff, it's really nice to see if teachers have some training in early childhood education and a real passion for working with young children. This is harder and harder to find these days because, unfortunately, we just don't pay these staff what they deserve. But having a low staff turnover, like the teachers have been at a facility for a long time, is a really big plus so that your kid can develop that nurturing relationship with the provider that they know. And you want to make sure that they perform background checks on all of their staff. You want to make sure that the program requires kids to be current on their immunizations to prevent vaccine-preventable diseases. And make sure that the facilities are routinely cleaned, that hand washing is emphasized before all meals and after toileting. For meals, you want to make sure that all food is stored and labeled appropriately. So like for younger kids, all breast milk and formula, they should have a protocol for that. Ideally, a program will serve healthy meals and snacks if meals are provided at your center. And although, of course, you hope that you never need it, um, should there be an emergency there should be a plan in place for any kind of emergency. So it'd be nice if the staff was trained in CPR and if there's a defibrillator, an AED on site, do they have emergency sheet available with each child and their medical history, their allergies, emergency contacts? Is there a fire evacuation plan? And in some places, you may need a plan for other natural disasters like tornadoes or earthquakes, depending where you live. 
And do they prioritize injury prevention? So, I mean, of course, any place that you have a child that is learning to ambulate and wobbly, it's not going to be perfect. So I've definitely gotten those car calls that are like, no need to panic, but Mira has like a big bonk on her head because she was running too fast and whacked into a door. But you do want to make sure that they they have this in mind, right? So are there age appropriate toys? Are they practicing safe sleep, especially if you enroll your child less than a year? Are they doing back to sleep with nothing in the crib? Um, and all staff should be trained on appropriate discipline strategies and, of course, child abuse prevention, how to identify it and how to report it. As parents, it's important to consider what your top priorities are when it comes to caring for your child. Yeah, I mean, for us, I work so much that I really wanted it to be close enough to our house that I could spend some time with her in the evenings. I wasn't driving in the car an hour to and from. So that was really big for us. I also wanted them to provide food because that's one less thing I have to do in the morning. And I wanted to have her feel excited to go eventually to find a place that that she was was happy to go and like be handed over to another caregiver eventually she was excited to go. <laughs> yeah, because I want to be realistic with parents that the first one to two weeks of daycare, partially depending on what age you start them at, but it's going to be really rough. There's going to be screaming and clinging to the parent. And this is totally normal and it will get better, but it is so emotionally, you know, taxing that first couple of weeks. Right. And so that's separation anxiety. That's normal. And you can find more information about separation anxiety in the episode that we did about that. Yeah. But let's say you did your research, you got on the wait list, you got your spot, you made it through a rough two weeks of a screaming toddler clinging to you, and you just survived the very first drop off with no tears. And then you get to your office and your cell phone rings. Um, Hi, Lena. This is not an emergency, but Mira has a fever of 101 and you have to come get her within the next two hours. Right. So that's a gut punch, but it's appropriate, right? Because that's how you want your day. You want your daycare to be free of kids who are obviously infectious to others. So you'd want other kids removed from uh. the daycare, too. So you've got to clear the rest of your schedule. You've got to find backup care. You've got to cover everything at work <laughs> and pick up your child. Yeah, this is not fun, but it does happen. And we want to be realistic with our listeners about what to expect. So parents should expect frequent illnesses once their child starts daycare. There's really no cause for concern as long as there are fewer than 11 respiratory illnesses per year in the first two years, up to eight in the years two to five and four and five to 11. That's hard to remember. But it's also important to remember when we say like one respiratory illness with fever a month, um, sometimes actually that's not always like once a month. It might be like in the winter months, like two a month uh, or even three a month. You may get back to back to back and that can be normal too, unfortunately. And so the fall and winter does always tend to be rough. So we're saying definitely kids in daycare get sick more. Yeah. Definitely, at least initially. So one study found that children under one year of age, the first six months of enrollment in child care increased the risk of hospitalization by 70 percent. I mean, you know, we we got hospitalized last year um, with bronchiolitis. Um, they find that the impacts of child care is much larger for kids without an older sibling. I kind of found that to be interesting because older siblings are important sources of illness exposure. So your big big sister may have already brought everything to you before you start daycare. Right. It's really of a function of the more contacts you have. Yeah. So one study done in the Journal of the American Medical Association Pediatrics followed 1,200 children and they found kids in large child care settings were twice as likely to have frequent colds at age two, but they were 70% less likely to have frequent colds at age six and 60% less likely at age 11. Right. So, I mean, there is some benefit down the road, right? Like hang in there and maybe you're going to get all of your illnesses or your more clinically significant illnesses over earlier. Yeah, get it over with. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, as much as we wish it did, daycare does not stop at respiratory illnesses alone. 
It does double the risk of viral tummy bugs causing vomiting and diarrhea and increase the risk for ear infections. But Dr. Dean, please tell me that we're not like messing up our kids by letting them get this sick this much early in life. You know, they're getting exposed to more things earlier in daycare, but they're also becoming immune. So I think it all averages out. It all balances out over time. Okay. So despite all of the illnesses and the mom guilt, I mean, I get when I'm racing out of work to go pick her up and she's like the last one there. I definitely see the benefits that daycare plays in my own personal life. I think that it allows me to be fulfilled in my career. Um, She gets to spend time with people who have more experience with childhood education, is always coming home with art projects and new words and new songs. And I think it can be really amazing and helpful for families that are looking for something like that. We hope this episode provided some clarification about the benefits and drawbacks of early daycare. And we hope that it helped highlight what to look for in quality early child care programs. Let's summarize today's topic. So half of young children in the U.S. attend an out-of-home daycare. Parents are always going to be conflicted about the pros and cons of sending their child to early daycare. But no matter what, there are both benefits and slight drawbacks to early enrollment. Some of the benefits include slightly higher cognitive outcomes, especially for children from lower socioeconomic backgrounds and when enrollment occurs after 18 months of age, and less frequent illnesses once they reach school age. (laughs) But many more illnesses over the first couple years of enrollment. And we reviewed things to look for when choosing a daycare. And just to remember that finding a safe, developmentally appropriate, emotionally supportive environment is the key. So you're happy with your daycare? Um, yeah, I mean, there's always going to be pluses and minuses to it overall. Um, I think that I am happy overall and I am happy that she is in a daycare. I don't think I would want her, especially at her age now. She's a little over two. She really needs that social aspect of things, the the structured day. So I'm I'm happy that I have her in a program. We may start looking for other things as she gets potty trained, a lot of other options open up to you. So there are many daycare centers. Some of them will take infants. So Mira started when she was nine months old. So she was in an infant program and those are a little harder to find. And then as they get older and and you have a kid that's potty trained, so maybe two and a half, three, there are lots more options. And so we may transition her once she's potty trained, but I've had really good experience at the program that she's been at. So I'd like to bring up another subject that might be a little bit sensitive, and I'm not the right person to bring this up. So just stop me if you want. But I mean, as you know, the people I work with primarily are women, right? Like Pediatrics tends to be a heavy female-dominated field. Yeah. So it's like, what, like 80% women or something? I mean, it's really, it's not like a little over half. It's really a, a large majority. And so a lot of the parents are both working, but it astonishes me that when a kid gets sick, both parents are working, who do they call to pick the kid up? Always the mom. It infuriates me. I know. I Always know. the mom, right? And, and like, that's not fair, right? <laughs> no. And, but I, I have just started not answering, and then they will call. <laughs> <laughs> so there so, the- Usually my phone will ring, and then I'll text Tom, you're going to get a call from, you know, our daycare in a minute or so. Um, because what they do always call me first, and I am the one that has the less flexible schedule between me and my husband. So that might have been the most valuable thing that we've talked about this whole podcast is moms, don't answer your phone. (laughs) Don't answer the phone. It's okay. Um, But then text your hubby or your partner and give them the heads up that that the daycare may be calling so that they answer. (laughs) That wraps up this episode of Kids Considered. You can find more information on our website, kidsconsidered.ucdavis.edu. Follow us on Twitter at Kids Considered. And Instagram at Kids Considered. If you have feedback on this show or topics you would like us to discuss in the future, we would love to hear from you. Please call us. Our number is 916-915-3388. Or email us at kidsconsidered at gmail.com. Please rate us on iTunes or wherever you subscribe to your podcasts. Thank you for listening, and we hope you will join us for our next podcast. Kids Considered is sponsored by UC Davis Children's Hospital.